everyone. Thank you for having the oh, ICRC uh, today, International Red Cross. So um, just uh, to have a look, who, know, who knows uh, what we do and who we are? Just raise your hand. OK, so just to refresh the memory. So we are an international organization, a military organization. We are based in Geneva, in Switzerland. So our mandate is to provide uh, humanitarian help and uh, help uh, victims of armed conflict in uh, relief operation uh, when there is a need. So, and you start to think why we are here, right? What is doing a uh, humanitarian organization here? So it's because uh, um, we're seeing with the digitalization of societies, there is uh, an increased transformation of how the wars are fought. So states are adding more and more digital means and method to their arsenal. And one of the worrisome trends we are seeing nowadays is that uh, um, digital technologies are bringing civilians and, uh, and uh, private uh, sector technologies company into the battlefield. So when I talk about private companies, I mean uh, cybersecurity companies, I mean uh, technology companies that are bring into the battlefield. So one of the m most important uh, um, principle in ICRC is the international humanitarian laws. This is a body of law. And one of the most important principle in this law is that uh, we uh, define two main group uh, of individuals and objects. So the first one is uh, the combatants and the military objectives. And the combatants are the people that are fighting in behalf of uh, uh, an army. And the second group uh, are the civilians and then civilians objects. And they should refrain from doing so. They should refrain to uh, combat, uh, to go in the battlefield. And thus, they should be protected against the arms and dangers that uh, uh, a war is uh, uh, producing. So this is the principle of distinction. So we have to distinguish between who is fighting the war and the rest of the population. So, and this shift uh, in, uh, in the digital technology so is bringing us to a uh, uh, two uh, qualitative aspects, one, uh, uh, two quali one qualitative aspect and one uh, quantitative one. So from the qualitative perspective, so the digitalization of society is, is bringing some, uh, some effect. One of them is that is lowering the threshold of entering the battlefield. So with some exaggeration, we can say that everyone with a smartphone nowadays can join the battlefield and do something for an army uh, to a conflict. And the other perspective is that uh, is also modifying, completely modifying the, rem the sense of remoteness that we have. So we can sit in our couch and we can participate to, uh, to the battlefield on the other side of, uh, of the planet. And uh, from a quantitative perspective, uh, is that uh, uh, states can scale up a massive amount of civilians to do what they need to do, like hundreds of thousands of civilians, regrouping them in hours, in days, to be able to fight uh, for them, and another perspective is the expansion of the attack surface. So the same smartphone that you can use to uh, attack could be also a victim of, uh, of, uh, of an attack. So it's not just the smartphone, laptop, computer, server, whatever. So the actual surface is way bigger than uh, what we have in the physical world. So this brings us to the civilization, so we call the civilization of the battlefield. So, Based on that, uh, let's have a couple of uh, scenarios to better explain the situation and the challenges we are facing here. So the first scenario is about uh, states that may encourage civilians to engage in offensive cyber operations, again, targets associated with the enemy. So it's the states that is asking its own civilians to participate to a conflict uh, in the digital battlefield. So this has uh, multiple advantages for a state. So individual can be easily mobilized and coordinated. So as I said before, you can put together hundreds of thousands of people to fight in your name. And uh, you can federate all already existing activists that they can be deployed for, uh, for your purpose. And all those uh, characteristics that bring us to this lower cost for entering the battlefield and for the states uh, to fight in the battlefield because they, they can use the civilians to do this work. So this is the first scenario we are talking about. The second scenario is uh, the states may repurpose existing e-government apps or creating new apps that are going to be used for, uh, for uh, uh, the purpose of the battlefield. So here we are talking about uh, 
uh, states that are mm, provided an app that you can use to, for instance, take a picture of a tank of, uh, of a tank of the enemy and then send it back to, uh, uh, to, the, to the army, to the central command and control and be used for the effort on the, on the kinetic side. So this has multiple advantages from the state's perspective because you are tapping into existing community of digital citizens. So can you imagine if you, prov if you have an e-government app that is, is being uh, used by three, four, five million of people that some point you transform, you enhance this application providing new method uh, in the application and then you provide this application, this new version of application to already uh, three, four, five million of people that are already using this application. So they are tapping into this uh, kind of situation. So this means that uh, you don't need any training for the people that are using this application because they are already used using this application. So it's everything what we do. I mean, open, download, take a picture, send a picture. These are normal gestures that we do daily. So there is no uh, training required. This also means that there is no latency. You don't have to train military uh, people on the ground. You just have uh, uh, civilians in the, in the digital battlefield that can adapt and use this application in a very quick way. And this means that the civilians are becoming sensor, uh, sensors to the, to the army, not just for intelligence purposes, but for any other kind of activity that the state would like to start in the, in the digital battlefield. This brings us to a third scenario where we have uh, the presence of technology companies, cybersecurity companies, and uh, so generally speaking, uh, private companies that are jumping into the digital battlefield. So, as you may know, I mean, the majority of the networks are owned or, or, or managed by private companies, and they are also managing assets that are military assets, not only civilian assets. So when uh, war starts, uh, those companies, they are inside the battlefield because they are already providing uh, support uh, or they are managing the networks of those uh, um, governmental bodies. So this may uh, bring us to the characteristic of that those companies are defending against deliberated cyber attacks. If you're already providing this kind of situation to, uh, to uh, governmental bodies, you find yourself in, uh, in defending against deliberated cyber attacks and you share threat intelligence with government bodies with states that are at the moment in war. So those are the three scenarios how civilians and, uh, and uh, private companies are involved in the battlefield. And these are first, a first bunch of consideration about the situation that we are expecting, that we are seeing uh, since the moment. So APT, so state-sponsored cyber attack, is not the only way to assess, no more the only way to assess state capabilities in the digital sphere. So we have a lot of more um, digital means and method that has to be integrated when we do an analysis of the capacity of a state in this, uh, in this sector. The second one is that the private company of civilians are now playing a, prope uh, um, a preponderant role in the conflict. What I mean with this is that when an army is losing visibility or capability on the, on the, on the battleground, they can use civilians to regain uh, this visibility, uh, this capability, and even surpass the capability of a state in the battlefield. A third consideration is that uh, we are assisting a civilization of the battlefield that is a, is, is a trend uh, since the moment now, and uh, this is a worrisome trend because we're bringing civilians into the battlefield. So a second, a second package of, uh, of considerations that uh, we still lack this cognitive process. So what does it mean? It means that uh, we are far from, uh, from the battlefield, but at the same time, we are in the battlefield using digital means. So this is a, 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 a distance between what we are living and what we are doing. So is this cognitive process is something that we're still uh, lacking nowadays, even after 30, 40 years that we are using internet, still uh, lacking of cognitive process. And this brings us to the perception of anonymity. So we are still, we are running a DDoS attack using a VPN. We think to be anonymous uh, from our couch. We do this and that. So this is perpetrating the, the anonymity. And with this, also the sense of impunity. We think uh, hey, nobody will find me because I'm using uh, all the security measure that uh, I can put in place uh, to not to be seen. So another is the performative nudging of the state. What does it mean? Does it mean that uh, the state, when is uh, enhancing uh, and modifying application, 
is pushing a little bit, gentle pushing the civilians to adopt this application that is already on their phone to use this application for, uh, for uh, um, war reason. So, and it's performative because as soon as this new capacity is, is uh, put in a, in a new application and uh, push on the store and then push on the phones, is used uh, very quick, so this is performative. So the speed of integration we already said, so this is very fast how to integrate civilians into the, the battlefield. And then we have uh, the involvement of private companies that are doing a normal business in peaceful time that at some point they find themselves into the battlefield. And the third uh, group of consideration is are civilians and private companies directly participating in hostilities? So this is the, the most important part. Are people that are doing this kind of business participating in hostilities? So we see three cumulative uh, uh, characteristics if, uh, if, to be declared as uh, participating in hostilities. So this is just a, a way to explain you how it is. I'm not saying that uh, one scenario or the other is direct participating in a city. The three scenarios that we have seen before, we can say that uh, depending from case to case could be considered as uh, participating in a city. But normally we should look at these three cumulative aspects. So one is the trash of a farm. So it means that uh, if you run, if you do this act, you provide, um, you have an impact on the military operation of a party to the conflict. So there is a real impact of what you are doing. The second one is the belligerent nexus, is knowing that um, if uh, you uh, design the act to be, uh, to reach the threshold of harm. So if there is a desire of designing this, uh, this act for providing this arm. And the third, the third one is that the direct causation, I mean, if we can know that uh, from the act that you are doing, the, the arm is provided by your intervention. So those are the three uh, characteristics. So if you, uh, if you have these three characteristics in the act that you are performing, you probably be participating in an in a armed conflict. So there are other characteristics that we have to look at uh, before saying that uh, one of the other scenario is direct participation in hostility, DPH. What we are saying is the temporal consideration for such time. So it does mean that. So in our perspective, ICRC perspective, if a civilian is opening an application, taking a picture or, or, or doing a, a, a DDoS attack and then closing the application, only during that time a civilian could be, and I say could be, Consider it as participating in hostilities. As soon as it closed, the application is not, is not more considered as participating in hostilities. Some critics of our view saying that this is too easy for uh, civilians to go in the battlefield and go out from the battlefield, so a kind of a revolving door. But again, case by case. And then there is the territorial consideration. Are you performing your act from inside the, the battleground? or from outside. So are you doing this stuff from outside the, uh, the battlefield? So these are also different uh, perspectives that we're gonna check after all. What are the consequences of everything here? So the first consequence, if you are DPHing, so directly participating in STT, you are not entitled to have the prisoner of war status. If you don't uh, have this title because you are a civilian participating in hostilities, you may lose immunity from domestic prosecution. I'm not explaining myself. So let's imagine you are attacking country A uh, with your means and uh, at some point the war is over and then uh, some years later you want to travel for, for vacation to this country. You could be prosecuted in this country because you participated in hostilities and then you have no immunity for that. So this means also that you lose protection from attacks. And when we talk about attacks, we, it's not just a cyber attack, but also physical attack. So someone that is participating in a city could lose the protection from being attacked also on a physical, on a physical way. So the consequences for the states, so states have mandatory uh, 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 it's mandatory for the state to uh, verify if uh, one person that is participating in authority is a combatant, is a civilian. So distinguish 
uh, what we said before, the, um, the principle of distinction for, for, the, for the states. The second one is the obligation of cost and care. So this means that the states have the obligation to help civilians to, uh, to provide precaution to the civilians. But this is uh, absolutely in tension with the fact that, that uh, states are nudging or pushing civilians into the battlefield. How you can uh, nudge and push civilians into the battlefield and at the same time uh, be sure to, uh, to provide cost and care to the civilian. The third one is that uh, states have to uh, respect international humanitarian law and there is another law, the international human rights law, so the right to life and uh, such, a, such a, a body of law that is fundamental also when we talk about the territoriality uh, of, uh, of uh, the battlefield. And so another consequence is this time for the private companies is that as the civilian is the possible loss of protection from being attacked. So even tech companies that are involved in the battlefield, they could face this situation if they are engaging in DPH uh, for one of the other uh, party to the conflict. And uh, one very interesting point is that tech and cybersecurity company property may become a military objective. So let's imagine you have a platform for sharing intelligence with a government body that uh, this government is involved in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a war and you provide a cyber threat intelligence to this, uh, to this state through a platform. This platform could become, and I say could because, it, again, depending from case to case, could become a military objective of an army to the conflict. So this uh, platform could be disrupted by uh, one of the other parties to the conflict. And so this brings us also to the territorial consideration that we have seen for civilians. So it depends from IHL perspective, from international humanitarian law, there is no difference if you are doing this from inside the battlefield territory or outside, but there are other body of law like uh, uh, human rights law that are taking in consideration territorial, uh, territorial uh, uh, consideration for, uh, for this. And, uh, Technology and cybersecurity companies could also be considered as an organized armed group. Again, here, exception and case by case. But it is possible that the tech companies that is providing uh, defensive capability or even uh, active uh, defensive capability could be cons uh, considered as organized armed group bind to one of the army, uh, one of the army to the conflict. So this, you can imagine the consequences of being considered uh, an organized group. Uh, this brings us to the conclusion. So the first one about the civilians. So I just put this point, civilians must be aware. So we're not talking anymore here on taking down a server of a ransomware group or, uh, or sneaking into a C2 of a state sponsor of an APT group. So we are talking about participating in a conflict. This is changing completely the situation uh, where you are involved. Uh, you have to be aware what you're doing uh, when, you, when you tip on your keyboard and be sure what you're doing here because you can be uh, attacked, again, with distinction and case by case, but you can have a kinetic and non-kinetic uh, answer to what you're doing. The second uh, conclusion is for the states. So we stress the fact that the states have to respect the principle of distinction between civilians and combatants. This is very important and this is something that is, uh, is very worrisome because we have seen a fusion between the two groups. And uh, if you are really bringing uh, civilians into the battlefield, please prioritize armless form of civilian involvement, like, I don't know, rebuilding uh, disrupted connections or, or setting up servers or whatever, but not using civilians for the aim of, of, of the war. The third one is uh, provide civilians with information. So as soon as the state is providing all the information to civilians saying, hey, you can do this and that, if you do the other, you take responsibility for your act, at least the state it could be said that he provided all the information useful for civilians to judge the situation. Logically comply with their duties, so with the IHL and, uh, and human rights law. So we said before that uh, we see a tension here between the duty and, uh, and uh, what in reality is happening and uh, the obligation of constant care 
we have talked before, so do not involve civilians, help civilians uh, against uh, this uh, civilianization of the battlefield and try to reverse the civilianization of the battlefield. So this trend must be stopped because we're seeing more and more tech companies, more and more civilians into the battlefield. And latest for uh, the companies, so we think that uh, companies need more awareness and training in international humanitarian law. So we had discussion with several tech companies and cybersecurity companies on this topic and they opened their eyes and said, ah, we, are, we were not aware about this. So this is very important that they start to have awareness and training and then prevent target mistakes. So when you do a offensive, uh, offensive security or something like that, just be sure if you shut down a command and control that this command and control is military dedicated command and control is not a dual use uh, command and control that is used also for civilian purposes. And proactively inform as a company what you are doing to avoid being attacked. So if you're doing protection or whatever, just let the, the, the world know what you're doing during the conflict. And uh, you should also develop compliance side of your companies and say, hey, are we doing the right? How are we now shifting to be a participant in the right to a conflict or not? So you have to be aware what you are doing uh, during the, this period. And then try to lobby to assure that civilian data should be protected as civilian assets. So till now the civilian data do not have the same level of protection as a civilian asset. So we advocate of uh, considering civilian data protected as civilian asset because when you di disrupt civilian data, you can cause a, a very uh, um, uh, harmful situation for civilians. And, uh, and most important stuff, we discussed also the other day uh, with an uh, attack against a satellite infrastructure, try to do segmentation of, uh, of uh, the asset that you are uh, providing to a government. So if a government wants to have an asset uh, uh, from your company, try to split between uh, a uh, civilian body of the government and military body of the government so that when there is a war exploding and someone is trying to attack those assets, is going to focus on the military one. Thank you, Juan. Take question. Thank you, Mauro. We have time for questions. Quickly, quickly, just get your hand. Hi there. Uh, thanks. Really enjoyed the talk. Uh, just one kind of question. It seems like an overarching theme in this is that there's sort of a dual use nature to all of this stuff that the, you know, like you said, a, like a cloud provider could be supporting a military, could also be supporting, you know, civilian businesses. And from a defender's perspective, you know, threats, although they can be nation state, they can be non-nation state, whatever, uh, you might just not care as a defender and you just want to, you know, protect your own system. So I guess because that distinction is hard on both sides, I think, do you see any room, or what specifically would you see, like on a, maybe on a policy side or a regulatory framework side that could help clarify that and help like deal with these dual use technologies in a way that helps distinguish civilian and military yeah. objectives? I'm thinking about if you, uh, thank you for the question. I'm thinking about if you have a contract with the government, uh, from the starting point, you have to uh, define uh, if this uh, military asset is this a civilian asset. So you have to be, uh, to be open with the government and saying uh, what the purpose of, uh, of, uh, of our help here, what kind of infrastructure are we securing. And then uh, it's up to you as a company saying, I don't want to protect a military entity because in case of war, I'm protecting something that can bring me to the battlefield. So this is up to the company having this, uh, this capability of distinguish already from the beginning of, of the contract and being clear with the government what they're doing. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the issues that you kind of have to deal with in both hot and cyber conflicts might be mercenaries. So um, what are your thoughts on kind of identifying private companies who might be affiliated with governments? That's a good question. So, I mean, IHL, international maintenance law, does not uh, uh, prohibit the participation in war. So this is up to, uh, up to everybody to know if they want to participate to a war. I mean, but that you have behaved in a, in a, in a matter that uh, you are not uh, uh, entitled to uh, 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 war crimes. 
But from this point of view, you have to be uh, aware of the fact that uh, if you are a mercenary participating into a conflict, you can be attacked afterward from one of the parties of the conflict, even in kinetic ways. So we're talking about a kinetic reaction to a cyber operation. So this is up to everyone uh, to do this. We, we try to get in touch with those mercenaries, uh, with uh, groups of people that are cooperating with the one of the other party, try to explain them what are the dangers behind to this, uh, to this situation, just that they know what they, uh, what they are facing. Thank you. Yeah, we take one last. Uh, no? One more. one more, last one, quickly. We have this man from Geneva all the way here. We have to make all the use of his time as we can get. Go ahead. Um, with digital warfare, everyone or more and more people have equal access to be a part of war. They don't have to be in a military base. They don't have to grow up and go to boot camp. Um, and I think as a people in general, we have a desire to fight for something. So you talk about um, try, trying to stop this, the civilianization of warfare, but I think it's the civilians that are, that are wanting to be a part of something. Could there be a benefit to having the states provide a way for the civilians to actively defend their country, which might, you know, shoo them away from trying to be offensive and potentially more damaging. Um, and if so, is that even something that's realistic or possible for states to give their citizens a way to defend without also creating a vulnerability for other countries to come in and know what's not defended or what needs to be fixed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a human being reaction if you want to take part of not from one of the parties of the conflict. I mean, you feel engaged in something. Uh, but on the other side, uh, what, we, what I'm showing here is with the digitalization, way easier to get into. So, and this is the lack of cognitive process. So when you think, I'm going to participate, you just open the laptop and doing something, right? It would be different if you have to go physically in the battlefield and taking a gun and participating. So this is the, the wall that is refraining you for doing this. That's why this is the problem of civilization. So we're bringing more and more civilians into the company because it's easy with digital means. And we have to think about this. Okay, it's easy, but the consequences are exactly the same as participating physically in the conflict. And that's the main message of, of the talk today is that. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Mauro. Thank you. Thank you very much.